Hello, I'm Dr. Mas Chaponda, a clinical research fellow at the University of Liverpool. I'm now going to go on to the second lecture in therapeutics for the MRCP part two. This lecture will mainly deal with drug overdose and drug abuse. Let's go straight into question number one. A top premier football manager recently expressed concern that some of the players had abnormally high red cell counts, a sign of misusing erythropoietin, also known as EPO. He bemoaned the fact that EPO had been administered to some players by their former clubs outside the UK, and they actually took the drug unknowingly. What is the best way of detecting EPO abuse? Which one of the following is the best way of detecting EPO abuse? I think I'll go through each one, but the answer is the first one, A. It can be detected in the urine for a few weeks following the most recent injection. EPO was used really in the early 1980s as a drug of abuse for those requiring to increase their oxidative gain. So what it does, it increases your red cell mass, and by increasing that mass, you increase your oxygen carrying capacity. And therefore, for short bursts of energy, you have more energy than your competitor. It doesn't increase muscle bulk. And C is obviously wrong because it can be detected for a few weeks. It can be detected in blood, not really, but mainly in urine, um, and not up to six months. So A is the only correct answer for EPO abuse. Let's now consider question number two. A 55-year-old man with a history of chronic alcohol abuse is admitted to the hospital having had a witnessed generalized seizure in the street. A bystander called an ambulance. He had a further seizure while in the ambulance on the way to hospital, terminated by PR diazepam. A third brief seizure occurs on arrival at the AED. He has no other significant past medical history of note and is not on any regular medication. He denies recreational drug use and has not drunk any alcohol in the past 24 hours. He's febrile, pulse is normal, blood pressure is normal, SATs are normal, as is his BM. A CT scan is performed and that is also normal. On return from the scanner, he suffers from a further seizure, which lasts about four minutes. Which one of the following is the most appropriate next step? Would you give him long term, short term and long term carbamazepine? Or would you go for IV lorazepam followed by sodium valproate? Or would you give him IV lorazepam? Or no epileptic treatment would be required? Or would you start on oral sodium valproate? Please consider these for a minute. This is a classic case of alcohol withdrawal and the way to terminate the recurrent seizures that he's been having in a rather short time is IV benzodiazepine and I would give lorazepam two to four milligrams depending on the size of the man which would control his seizures in the short term. In the long term there are no anti-epileptics that are recommended or that are needed. This is alcohol related detox. It usually happens between eight hours to 24 hours after stopping drinking alcohol. This is in alcohol abuse cases. He should be on long-term medication because we're told he's not taking anything. He should be taking thiamine, B vitamins, and he should be taking multivitamins. But there is no evidence for long-term use of carbamazepine. And now question number three. A 17-year-old girl is admitted to hospital having taken a paracetamol overdose. The precipitant was an argument with her boyfriend which ended up in them splitting up. She took 24 500 milligram tablets, so that's 12 grams of paracetamol with a bottle of cider. The following morning, she regretted her actions and told her parents what she had done. Which one of the following, if present in her case, is least likely to indicate a poor prognosis? Please consider these five options. I'll give you a minute to consider them. This young lady has taken a significant overdose of paracetamol, over 14 tablets would be considered significant and she's presenting late the following morning. The markers that we're being asked for are what are the markers that are, would indicate poor prognosis? 
In short, the INR is the probably the best informative marker. An INR greater than two at two days, or an INR greater than three on day three are poor prognostic markers. In addition, the pH, if the blood pH is less than 7.3, or the blood lactate is greater than three, that would also indicate poor prognosis. In addition, if the patient is encephalopathic, or if they have hypotension, so a systolic blood pressure less than 80, or indeed, if they have acute renal failure with a creatinine greater than 300, all these are markers of poor prognosis and should really be picking up the phone and speaking to either Birmingham or Leeds. All these are tertiary centers for liver transplant and they should be considering liver transplant. Liver function tests, like the ALT there, are very poor correlation to prognosis. So your ALT can be right up to the 1,000, 3,000, 9,000 even. And within a few days, it can return back to normal without the need for a liver transplant. So ALT is a poor prognostic marker, and therefore it is the only one in that list of five which I would not consider as a prognostic marker. So it is the least likely to indicate a poor prognosis. Let's now consider another toxin in question number four. A 32-year-old farmer is brought into the emergency department one evening after becoming increasingly confused over the previous five hours. He has been feeling well at breakfast before going out to work in the fields, but staggered into the house in the late afternoon, complaining of nausea and vomiting and generally feeling weak. He now has profuse diarrhea and associated abdominal cramps. He is diaphoretic and salivating profusely. He is disorientated regarding time, place, and person. His pupils are equal and constricted. His temperature is 36.9. His heart rate is slow at 54. JVP is not elevated. Blood pressure is 102.54, and his heart sounds are normal. Respiratory examination reveals bilateral expiratory wheezes, but no crepitations. His saturations are 92% on air. His abdomen is soft and diffusely tender, but there is no guarding or rebound tenderness, and bowel sounds are present. Power is globally reduced, about four out of five, with slightly depressed reflexes, but plantar reflex is flexor. There are few fasciculations that are noted in his legs, and his coordination and sensation are unimpaired. Therefore, which one of the following is the likely diagnosis? And here again, we have five options, and I would like you to consider these for a minute. This is a case of organophosphate poisoning. It is very different to the presentation of the, all the others. And I will summarize the findings in organophosphate poisoning. And here, we have a little mnemonic to help you. Sludge, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation and diarrhea, all of these that he has. Gastrointestinal symptoms, he has the abdominal pain and emesis. In addition, you can have bradycardia, you can have the fasciculations and the pinpoint pupils. The treatment for various toxins is now listed here, and I think I will point out important ones. We'll start first with organophosphates. So organophosphates can be treated with atropine. That's the first treatment, especially if they're bradycardic and if they have secretions, which are muscarinic effects. And here, you would continue titrating treatment until the chest dries up and until the bradycardia improves. But other antidotes to, con to consider when we're treating with uh, poisons. If you have oral anticoagulants such as warfarin, if the INR is great, greater than eight and there is bleeding, you can give a vitamin K, which is an antagonist to warfarin. For benzodiazepines, you can give flumazenil. For beta blockers, you can use atropine and glucagon. And for carbon monoxide poisoning, you can use oxygen or hyperbaric oxygen is preferred. Others are listed on the slides over there, where you will see digoxin-specific antibody, which can be used. And for ethylene glycol, similar as in methanol, you can use ethanol or formipizol for the treatment of these. These are alcohol, and you're using ethanol as a competitive antagonist at the receptors. For methemoglobin, you can use methylene blue. And then there you see the organophosphates, which is insecticides, especially in farmers like this gentleman we have just been discussing where you'd use atropine or pralidoxim can also be used. 
For, N uh, for paracetamol overdose, you can use NAC, and we'll talk about that later. For opioids, you would use naloxone. Let's now consider question number five. A 21-year-old man is brought to hospital by ambulance. The ambulance was called by his girlfriend, who found him semi-conscious and hyperventilating, surrounded by a number of empty packets of aspirin. Apparently, there had been a row that morning. Blood tests reveal a potassium of 3 and a salicylate of 110. Which one of the following issues regarding treatment fit best with aspirin overdose? Please consider these five and choose which one would be the most appropriate. There is really only one, and this, if you look back at the story, has to do with the timing, and therefore the overdose is presumed to have taken place in the morning, according to the Rao, and the levels of aspirin. So a six-hour level is what is recommended, and if your level is between zero and 400, one would use fluid resuscitation and use fluid to eliminate the aspirin. If your, fluid, if your level was between 400 and 700, you would use forced alkali, you'd used alkaline diuresis, not forced alkaline diuresis, because forced alkaline diuresis can cause pulmonary edema, but you would use alkaline diuresis or alkalinization of the urine would be a better term. If it was greater than 700, you would use, in this case, hemodialysis. So his levels are 110, and he's presenting with aspirin overdose. Charcoal actually can be used even though it's more than four hours. It is debatable, but some studies have shown that with aspirin, multi-dose activated charcoal can be used. And so C would be the right answer. Pulmonary edema is not an indication for dialysis, and that wouldn't be the case in here. Urine should be alkalinized. Serum salicylate injection, ingestion indicates severe overdose. They do not. They are only 110 and potassium should be replaced. Potassium is three, I wouldn't I would probably cautiously replace that. The right answer would be C. I think this question highlights the use of activated charcoal. So usually in overdose, you would use the charcoal within one to two to four hours even of overdose. However, multi-dose activated charcoal has recommendations for several drugs because it interrupts the enterohepatic, enterogastric and enterohepatic circulation of adsorbed drugs. So these are drugs that are absorbed, processed by the liver, secreted, and then reabsorbed again. And mainly the drugs here are carbamazepine, dapsone, phenobarbitin, quinine, and theophylline. And there's an example there of the multidose activated charcoal, which you'd give us 50 grams, even if they present late. Salicylates, as I said, can be controversial, but some people have recommended using it even with late presentation. And some people would even recommend using multi-dose activated charcoal in patients where they have taken MR drugs, so prolonged release drugs. So, um, for example, if they've taken diltiazem, prolonged release drugs. This is because of the long life that you're trying to absorb while it's still in the gastrointestinal tract remembering that multi-dose activated charcoal, charcoal itself, can cause constipation. And therefore, if there's any evidence of bowel obstruction, then that is clearly contraindicated. And on to question number six. A 52-year-old woman is brought in unconscious by ambulance. On admission to the AED, she has a glasmocoma score of six. Her airway appears to be compromised her sister follows by car and suggests that the woman has taken a large overdose of temazepam tablets. She is known to use these on a regular basis and also takes amitriptyline. Urea electrolytes are unremarkable, but arterial blood gases suggest a respiratory depression with both raised CO2 and decreased O2 levels. Which one of the following is the most appropriate management step? And here are five options for you to consider. Remembering that Probably all of these, or some of these, are appropriate, but only one of them is really relevant for you to do in the immediate setting. We are told that her airway is compromised. We know that her CO2 is rising and her O2 is low. Immediately, that should ring alarm bells, and this should tell us, get an anesthetist down there. She needs to be intubated and ventilated. 
I would not observe this lady in high dependency unit because she is gradually going to deteriorate. She has taken temazepam and you would think the treatment for temazepam and benzodiazepine overdose is flumazenil and you wouldn't be wrong. However, in this case, we're also told that she is on amitriptyline and we know that amitriptyline lowers your seizure threshold. Flumazenil, if you don't get the dose right, can also cause seizures and these will be very difficult to treat seizures. So in this particular case, I would not give flumazenil, although it is the right drug for treating benzo overdose. I wouldn't give naloxone because this is not an opiate that she has taken and I certainly would not give continuous flumazenil infusion for the same reason as we've explained in C. Let's now look at question number seven. A 68-year-old woman presents to the emergency department with vomiting, diarrhea, and confusion. Medical history reveals mild renal impairment with a creatinine of 189 and a potassium of 6.2. Other history of note is chronic atrial fibrillation, which is rate controlled with digoxin. Her GP has recently increased the dose of digoxin and commenced diuretics for heart failure. Her digoxin level is 18. Soon after admission, she becomes unwell with a blood pressure of 95 over 50 and obvious ventricular tachycardia on her ECG. Which is the most immediate intervention in this case? And here are five options and I would like you to choose one which would be the most appropriate immediate intervention. This is a clear case of digoxin overdose, accidental, capped up with a raised potassium. They could have added that her vision appears yellow, not that she's jaundiced, but one of the features of digoxin overdose is yellow vision, um, as well as we're told all the other factors that she has ventricular tachycardia. The most important thing in that history is the ventricular tachycardia. She has an arrhythmia and has to be treated immediately. And so the only option there would be to give 250 milligrams of IV phenytoin over five minutes. Phenytoin is the choice treatment. You could, if she had no pulse, go for E, arrange for a DC cardioversion, but we are told she, that's not the case. She's alert, she's awake, and so that's why phenytoin is the choice. Digibind takes a long time to find in the hospital, and there's a lot of messing around while we're trying to read how to dilute it, how to make it up, and therefore I wouldn't wait for Digibind. I would treat the life-threatening arrhythmia first with phenytoin. Insulin dextrose refers to the hyperkalemia. That's the least of her worries at the moment. It's the VT, and that should be treated with phenytoin. In time, you will do D. You will bring down the potassium, you will use salbutamol nebulizers, you will even give insulin dextrose. But the priority for the time being is the phenytoin and digibind. And then monitor that digoxin level, the potassium and the magnesium very closely. Let's now look at question number eight. You see a lady who has taken a paracetamol overdose. She takes a number of concomitant drugs. You decide that her concomitant medication means that you need to follow the high-risk normogram. Which one of the following agents fits best with increased from paracetamol overdose? What we're being asked to look at is which of these drugs makes it high risk for paracetamol overdose, i.e. the lower line on the normogram. Please look at these drugs and consider which one of these increases the risk of paracetamol overdose. And the correct answer here is phenytoin. To understand this, I'm going to go through the metabolism of paracetamol. So paracetamol undergoes phase one and phase two metabolism. In phase one, it is processed by the cytochrome P450 enzymes. In particular, if you look at the slide, you will see CYP2E1. That will do the redox reaction, forming a toxic metabolite, which is N-acetyl-P-benzoquinone-emane. That is what binds to protein and causes damage. That is what NAC clears. If your body is low in glutathione, which is supposed to inactivate NAPQ, 
if your body is low in glutathione, you have a buildup of this toxin, and this toxin causes the damage. Certain drugs lead to the buildup of this toxin. So in this diagram, you'll see phase one, phase two, and remembering that phase one leads to this toxin being built up. Once you give a drug which induces the breakdown of paracetamol, you get a buildup of the metabolite, the toxin. So all drugs which are CYP, 3A4 induces, induce the breakdown of paracetamol into its toxic metabolite. And moving on to the next slide, you will see all those drugs which induce CYP, 3A4. And here's a useful mnemonic, crap GPs. So carbamazepines, rifampicin, chronic alcohol abuse, phenytoin, griseofulvin, phenobarbitin, sulfonylureas. In addition, tobacco smoking, the pill, spironolactone, can all be enzyme inducers. And so any of these drugs, when taken concomitantly with paracetamol, will lead to increased paracetamol toxicity. And therefore, when treating them, you must use the high-risk line, the lower line on the normal gram for treating patients with paracetamol overdose. Let's now consider question number nine. A 27-year-old teacher is brought into the emergency department having suffered a tonic-clonic seizure, which was abated with 10 milligrams of intravenous diazepam en route in the ambulance. She had been discovered by her boyfriend, who had found an empty packet of tablets next to her convulsing body. He has not thought to bring it in with him, but thinks that it had been full earlier that morning. Which one of the following drugs is the most likely toxicant? I'll give you a second to consider these. The only correct one here is methanamic acid, also known as Ponstan. And I'll explain, Ponstan, or methanamic acid, is a non-steroidal. Most non-steroidals in overdose are quite safe. They may give a bit of gastric irritation, gastritis, and occasionally they can cause acute renal failure. But Ponstan is the only one that's associated with convulsions. Other drugs that are associated with convulsions in overdose include theophylines and amitriptyline. Paracetamol, we've discussed before how it presents in overdose with hepatic impairment. Dihydrocodine is an opiate which would lead to suppression of respiratory function, as would clonazepam, whereas coamoxiclav would lead to renal and hepatic impairment. Now for question number 10. An 18-year-old girl is admitted after a collapse at a nightclub. She was out celebrating her birthday with friends. Her friends tell you that she doesn't drink alcohol. Apparently, she was looking for water to drink and seemed a little confused just before she collapsed. On examination, she is pyrexial and unconscious. She has bilateral dilated pupils. Her blood pressure is high at 165.92 and she's tachycardic. Hemoglobin is fine. She is... She does not have an elevated white cell count. However, her potassium is on the higher side, as is her creatinine, and her CK is markedly elevated. In her urine, she has blood. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? And again, there are five options here, and I'll give you a moment to consider these. There are several clues here which tell us that she has taken MDMA, which is ecstasy. She has, if we go back to her history, one, been on a birthday party. So it's likely that she has taken a drug at the party. We're told that she hasn't taken any alcohol, but she was looking for water. And you know that in ecstasy, when it's taken in some people, they will want an excess drinking of water because of the excess sweating and hypothermia that she also has. So enough clues there. But in addition, they tell us that she has dilated pupils, she has hypertension, again pointing towards ecstasy. Further to that, they tell us she's got renal impairment, she has blood in her urine, and she has a rhabdomyolysis because her CK is elevated. All these point to ecstasy use. In terms of treatment, one would want to cautiously hydrate. Fortunately, her sodium is 140. Remembering that in some of these cases, 
when we say the patient was out looking for water, they might drink themselves into a hyponatremia. And so you have to be very careful when you're rehydrating these patients. But she, her, her sodium is at 140, would have cautious rehydration, as well as you could consider giving alkalinization of the urine because she has rhabdomyolysis. You would also treat with benzodiazepines for the agitation that is associated. And you could also consider, if necessary, in, in cases of ecstasy overdose with hypertension, treatment of that. And you can use various compounds for the treatment of hypertension. Mm -hmm.